Hey guys, it's been a while since I've done a video. For those of you that asked, I sustained an injury to my elbow at work, so I haven't been able to swing any knives or machetes or any heavy tools like that. But while I'm recovering and unable to swing tools, I decided I'd do a video on something that doesn't require swinging. Today it is going to be flashlights. Now this video is going to be aimed at the beginner that doesn't know a whole lot. This isn't for you flashlight know-it-alls. This is basically just a video to help the new guy make a good decision when he's out buying a flashlight. Now the first thing I want to address is why is it called a flashlight? Well to get the answer to that we have to dive into a little bit of history. An English inventor named David Massell filed for a patent in 1898 for a device that was powered by D batteries that were laid front to back in a paper tube with a light bulb and a rough brass reflector at the end. The following year he sold this patent to the American Electrical Novelty and Manufacturing Company. The company donated some of these devices to the New York City Police Department who responded favorably to them. These early flashlights ran on zinc carbon batteries which could not provide a steady electric current and required a periodic rest to continue functioning. Because these early flashlights also used energy inefficient carbon filament bulbs, resting occurred at short intervals. Consequently, they could only be used in brief flashes, hence the popular name flashlight. Let's start with batteries. Batteries are the most important part of the flashlight because that's what provides the energy. I'm a big fan of conventional batteries and I highly recommend that when you select a flashlight that you choose one that uses conventional batteries. By conventional I mean D, C, AA and AAA batteries. These are available at just about any store or any bazaar in the world. The capacity of a battery is measured in milliamp hours. A milliamp hour is the easiest way to distinguish the strength or capacity of a battery. The higher the milliamp hours, the longer the battery will last. Batteries with different milliamp hour ratings are interchangeable. If your battery is rechargeable, the milliamp hour rating is how long your battery will last per charge. Think of a car's gas tank. Voltage is how much gas is being used and the milliamp hours is the size of the tank. The bigger the gas tank rating, the longer the device will run. If your battery is rechargeable, then think of the gas tank as refillable. If you want your light to have the longest possible runtime, then you need to select large batteries. I have here a comparison of several different types of batteries, and I'd like to show you the milliamp ratings for these. Now first, we have the AAA battery. Right here is the typical capacity in milliamp hours. According to this chart, alkaline provides the highest ratings for milliamps. Now, as you can see, a AAA battery provides 1200 milliamp hours in the alkaline version. A AA, which is not that much bigger, provides more than double the milliamps, 2700 milliamp hours, compared to the 1200 of a AAA. And it goes on up. A C battery provides 8000 milliamp hours, and a D battery provides 12000 milliamp hours. And as you can see, a D battery has 10 times the capacity of a AAA battery. 12,000 milliamp hours for a D, 1,200 for a AAA. The larger the battery, the longer it's going to run. To give you a perspective, this Streamlight Nano uses four LR41 button cell batteries and it only runs for eight hours. Compared to this Maglite, which uses 3D batteries and runs for 72 hours. That's a big difference, guys. There are some non-conventional batteries that are worth looking at, and these are the CR123 types, like the one used in this Surefire X300 weapon light, and also in this Surefire E2D many many tactical lights use the CR123 batteries. CR123 batteries are lighter than uh, ba comparable batteries of the same size that are alkaline. They pack a lot more power and they have a 10-year shelf life. 
However, they are considerably more expensive. Again, I recommend conventional batteries such as C, D, double and triple A's. There's nothing worse than not being able to find a battery for your light. The next thing I'd like to cover is switches. The two most common types is the twist and the push button switches. There are other ones such as the remote switches for weapon lights, but that's a whole other video in itself. By far the most popular switches are the twist switches and the push button switches. Here's an example of a push button switch mounted on the side of the light, as you see here. Another popular switch is the tail cap switch. If you can at all help it, I would recommend getting a light with a tail cap switch. It's just more intuitive to use. Twist switches have their place, and I believe that that place is in the smaller flashlights, where you are trying to save on space by not putting a regular switch on the end of the light. An example of this would be this Phoenix E01. This is a twist operation light, and for a light this size, I think that's perfect. The addition of a tail cap switch to a light that size would add overall length. And if portability is your thing, twist switches are probably the way to go. As far as bigger lights, such as the Maglite Mini, I absolutely can't stand the twist switch. Twist switches have to be built relatively stiff for them to not come on accidentally. And the Maglite Mini certainly does not excel in that department. It's very easy to twist that switch and that's exactly what happens when the light is riding on your belt or in your pocket. It is important that you look for a recessed switch no matter where it's mounted. An example of this would be like the Surefire E2D. As you can see, the switch is recessed inside the body of the flashlight. There's a bit of a shroud around the switch that prevents accidental operation. Another example of a badly designed switch would be this Coast LED Lenser Light. As you can see, there's no shroud around the switch here, and it protrudes outside of the light's body. This will turn the light on in your pocket or, or wherever you happen to carry it, because anything that this switch bumps onto will turn the light on and drain your batteries. So when you're looking for a flashlight, try to pick a switch that has some kind of shroud or is at least somewhat recessed into the body of the light, like this mag light here. I haven't had this type of switch give me a whole lot of problems. Part of the reason is it is relatively stiff and this is a large light, so you're not gonna carry this in your pocket. Switches are the most prone part to fail in a flashlight, like this Coast LED lenser here. I can't tell you how many times this thing flickers on and off just because the switch is a piece of shit. An important feature of any switch, I feel, is the momentary mode. Instead of having to push all the way down and get a click for a constant on, a momentary operation means that you can tap the switch and get the light to flash. This is very useful if you're using your light as a signal device. The Coleman lights that I have here don't have that ability. By tapping the switch, you don't get the light to come on. Not as good for a signaling device. Also, a momentary switch that allows you to flash your light rapidly without having to go into a constant on mode eliminates the need for some of the fancy flashing modes that come with flashlights nowadays. Another thing to note is that you're not going to be able to get momentary operation with a twist switch. That's probably why Maglite built several signaling modes into their light, but I find flashing modes almost useless. This is also another reason why I hate blister packs. If you're at a store and you're looking at a light that's packaged in a blister pack, you're not going to be able to see if the switch has momentary function or not. You're probably going to have to look at a review to see whether or not those switches offer momentary operation. It's not something that manufacturers are known for putting on the packaging. I think that a vital feature of a good twist switch is that it has to be stiff. If the thing twists on inside your pocket or on your belt, then it's not a good switch. The operation of a twist switch should be very stiff and that kind of prevents one-handed operation. Here's another example of a badly designed switch. This Coast LED Lenser originally came with two switches. One right here for a white light and there used to be another switch right here where 
this turned on the red light, which is the center LED right here. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've pulled this light out of my pocket in pitch black and hit the wrong button where the red light came on where I wanted the white light to come on. And actually it got to the point where it annoyed me so much I took the light apart and ripped out the red switch. So switch placement is very important and you want to try to avoid having a whole bunch of switches. 